Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have as we study together. We invite your Holy Spirit's presence and we pray, Lord, that um, you will speak to us individually and as a group. We ask, Lord, for your guidance in the study this evening, that you can help me and in directing this study, that you can direct me. And we ask that you can enlighten our minds and open our hearts to you, that we can receive your blessing on this Sabbath. We, th we are thankful for the fellowship that we can have and for each person, whether they um, can participate live or whether they study these uh, studies later, uh, we ask, Lord, that you can bless them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, remember to keep your microphones off unless you're going to be speaking, just because it, it creates some noise in the background in the recordings. It doesn't normally distract me, um, but it can distract other people. I had seven kids, so I can easily uh, block out external sounds. But uh, anyway, happy Sabbath, everyone. Now, in this study, uh, we've been studying the sanctuary from Eden lost to Eden restored uh, for quite a while now. This is going to be study number 27. And we've just been doing this on Fridays. So that's, I guess, technically 27 weeks of, of studying beginning at Genesis. And now we, we've just uh, finished studying last week, Exodus um, 33 and 34. And I was looking at, at, at this topic and trying to figure out where we would go next. And I, and I can't really remember what I was thinking last week as far where I thought we might be going. But one of the things I had thought about, I knew I was thinking about the garments of the priests. And I was looking at Leviticus 26, reading through it. And there's so much in Leviticus 26 that we could study in connection with the sanctuary obviously because it's talking about the work of the sanctuary and the work of the priests but where i'm going to direct us today is to numbers chapter three and what this is doing is following the thread that we picked up in genesis chapter three so in genesis chapter three we had the gospel promise about the seed of the woman and and what we what we have noticed is that this that the scriptures is addressing this seed of the woman from the beginning of scriptures to the end. That is, starting with with Adam and Eve, she has a child, and uh, the first child that she has is Cain. That's named, and and she she believes that Cain is going to be that promised seed. So. They don't have the scope, Adam and Eve don't have the scope of the whole history of the world. But God uses this history um, at the beginning, and it's reflected in the Revelation. So in the Revelation, we also see the seed of the woman. The woman is the church in Revelation chapter 12. And there's some interesting points that we're going to notice that... I don't know if I've ever thought of them before. So maybe other people have, maybe there's other people who've had this insight, but I, I never had. So when we look at Revelation 12, chapter 12, and, and this is nothing new, but what we're going to study here is um, some things that I have noticed. So in Revelation chapter 12, we have this, this wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon. So this is the serpent, right? Because, I mean, we're told that, um, that in, in later that, um, where is this here? 
dragon stood in. And yeah, in, in verse nine, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So one of the things we see here, I mean, we know that there's the deception that happened in the Garden of Eden, but that deception is repeated at the end of the world. And, and so the deception isn't just something that happened to Adam and Eve. It is a continual deception, and it's going to be manifest in our time in what way? How is the deception manifested? Well, in the world, love not the world. Okay. So we're going to have three parties involved. Who are those parties that are involved at the end of the world? False prophet. The false prophet. Okay. <clears throat> beast, dragon, false prophet. So we have the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Now, thinking about the story of Adam and Eve, who are the three parties involved? At the, that, that deception that happens in the Garden of Eden. You got man, Satan, and Christ. Okay, well, you don't have Christ as far as one of the parties in that deception. All oh, right, well, okay, yeah, true. <laughs> so, so you have the woman and the man and, and the dragon and the serpent. All right, right. Okay. Now, the woman would represent the church. Satan would represent the dragon power, right? So who does Adam represent? The state. Okay, so Adam would, would represent the state. That is, he was given dominion. But we know that this is the first deception, and it becomes a type of what happens later on for the whole world. Um, and so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we, we look at this story. Now, what we're going to be studying, though, is Numbers chapter 3. So I, I want you to keep these things, this thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation, to keep this in the back of your mind as we look at the Levites. Now, uh, Numbers chapter 3, some of you are quite familiar with this, because uh, this is where uh, the sons of Aaron and, and the Levites are going to be given charge over the sanctuary. And the Levites are going to be replacing the firstborn. And so we're going to look at that a little bit and see what this, what this is referring to. And, and we've studied this before. So, so for some of us, this isn't going to be new, but we're just going to be looking at it a little bit differently in the context of this thread that we just discussed, that we just put in place. Now, um, So we'll start at verse five. So we're going to leave that first part of Numbers three alone. And then we're going to go here. It says the duties of the Levites. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So what is this about the firstborn? What is this a reference to?
Well, firstborn usually um, didn't they receive the uh, everything the father had to give them? Okay, so they have a blessing that's given to them. Yes. Right. So the firstborn receives this special blessing, and that blessing is he, and this comes from from the seed of the woman, right? So the idea of the seed of the woman is there is this firstborn, and the firstborn is the one who receives this special blessing. Um, so the firstborn receives the kingship. That is, he's the head of the family. Also the priesthood. And as well, he receives the double portion. The question is why? Why, why is this given to the firstborn? What is this typifying? Uh, first fruits, I think. Okay, first fruits. Do you have any more explanation? Uh, well, Christ, uh, I forget where the verse is at. Um, talk about the first fruits. Okay. Okay. Uh, those are resurrected, I think, and no, not that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so the word first is there, but I don't know if it's tied yeah. together. Yeah, um, I don't know either. Now, the first time that that we see, well, we also have the birthright, right? So we know that this has to do with the birthright, and I'm just going to look that up here. So the first time the birthright is mentioned is in connection with Jacob buying the birthright from Esau. So, so I don't know of any other place where that's specifically mentioned first, other than in Genesis 25, 31, at least the word birthright. So, so this is where we get this idea of the birthright um, that when it's mentioned, and he's going to sell that, Esau is, he's gonna sell it to Jacob for a mess of pottage, right? So he's gonna buy some, some lentils. And so Esau despised his birthright. But the question is, where does this birthright come from? How, how would we illustrate this? I mean, the Bible doesn't, it doesn't give us, a, at least I haven't been able to find some clear point where God says, you're going to, receive this um right at the beginning we see it sort of inferred as we go through different scriptures i think it's the symbol of jesus okay yes it's a symbol of jesus right so we go back to this promised seed that somehow in this promised seed even though it's not explicitly stated right at the beginning that there is this inherent birthright it's implied in this promise of, of the gospel promises of Genesis 3.15. Um, so here's, here's another statement. This is Deuteronomy 21.17, um, where it talks about inheritance rights of the firstborn. If a man of two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Now, this is in Deuteronomy. So this is, you know, 430 years or 431 years since Abraham left Haran. So, so this is going back to that story. When you do the story of Jacob and Esau, we can see with Jacob and Esau, there was this issue about which one, of course, is the firstborn. It's not nothing to do with different parents but we're going to see that we have this issue arising um with the sons of jacob so so all this time we have this firstborn and and do we have 
the firstborn always receiving the inheritance. Is he the one that the promised seed is going to come through? Is it always the firstborn? No. No, it, it's not. And, and, and the question is why? When God has this law of the firstborn, why is it often superseded? That is, when it comes to the promised seed, um, Cain, he's the firstborn. The promised seed doesn't come through him. Right? It's, it's going to come um, through who? Who does the promised seed? Where is Christ's seed? Where does his line go through? He goes Seth through, at the beginning, right? Through Seth, right? So it's going to go through Seth, not through Cain. And, and Cain kills Abel. So obviously, I mean, we don't, we don't have anything about Abel's descendants, per se. But we know that Christ comes through the line of Seth, not through the line of Cain. And so all through the Bible, we're going to see this line of Christ, his, where this promised seed line goes through. And it's not going to always be through the firstborn. You know, Jacob and Esau. Esau is the firstborn. Christ is not descended from Esau. He's descended from Jacob. Right? Jacob's going to have uh, Judah. Christ is going to be descended from Judah. You have well, Isaac and Ishmael. Not the firstborn. What's that? You have Isaac and Ishmael, too. Yeah, and Isaac and Ishmael. Now, Ishmael, of course, I mean, he's not the promised seed because it was going to be through Isaac. But yeah, you could argue that Ishmael and Isaac, again, the firstborn, it's Christ isn't going to come through Ishmael. He's going to come through Isaac. So, so we have this law of the firstborn, but it often seems to be superseded. Right? And, and we can even see this with, um, uh, you know, in, in different lines within um, the kings as well. So, so there's lots of places we could we could look and we could find that it's not the firstborn that the promised seed goes through yet this is the law of the firstborn is that they receive the double portion now as far as receiving the kingship and the priesthood i, I don't see that these are are explicitly stated they're more inferred and and one of the places that these are inferred of course is in genesis when we have um Chad brings his family. It's Genesis, whatever. Yeah. So Jacob, when he blesses his sons, right? So he's going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, those are Joseph's sons. Now, Jacob, of course, has this divided family because he has two wives and their concubines. So he has basically four wives. And he's going to have these 12 sons from these four women. And Jacob, he had received the birthright, which he which his brother sold him, but I mean, it was obviously his to begin with um, based upon God's promises, based upon how God operates. It should have been Jacob's, not Esau's, because Esau despised his birthright. He didn't really value it. But Jacob is not going to uh, have one of his sons take that first, that the rights of the firstborn, he's going to divide it among his sons. So Joseph gets the double portion, right? His two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, receive this double portion. And so there's this special blessing for Manasseh and Ephraim. And then Jacob, when he gives, get, gathers his sons together long, a while before he dies, but he thinks that he's going to die. Um, He's going to go through each of his sons, and we're going to see that he starts with Reuben, the firstborn. But Reuben doesn't receive the priesthood or the kingship or the double portion. And when he's going to go through about, you know, Simeon and Levi, uh, when he talks about... Um, 
Simeon, Levi, are brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and I will scatter them in Israel. So, particularly with e Levi, how is Levi scattered in Israel? He's given no land. Yeah, he's not given any land. He's given cities amongst all the 12 tribes. And then Judah is going to receive the kingship. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So it's kind of interesting we have with Levi this scattering that's talked about, and also it's with Simeon as well, and I'm not sure how it applies to Simeon particularly. Um, but we're going to see that with Judah, there's a gathering that's referred to. And with Judah, this gathering, of course, is referring to the fact that the temple is going to be built in Jerusalem, which is in the tribe of Judah. But also, we can see that the 2520 for Judah has a gathering that is they're gathered at the end. So there's, so there's some other references there. We have the reference of a scattering, the reference of a gathering. So there we have, um, and with Levi, the reason why Levi is going to be scattered is because they're going to receive the priesthood. So it's inferred in this blessing of Jacob and his sons that the birthright is not going to one of them, but it's, it's going to be given to three different um, of the sons divided in this way. Now, why that happens and why the law of the firstborn and the double portion and so forth occur in the way that they do, um, like we see in Deuteronomy 21, 17. I mean, here we have this law, but as far as when it comes to how God is operating of who is the firstborn, and how this blessing is passed on, it's not going to be done as through the flesh. It's going to be done through the spirit. That is, who are the children of Abraham? It's the spiritual children of Abraham who are the children of Abraham, not according to the literal seed. And, and why is that? Why do we have this literal aspect and this spiritual aspect at the beginning. Why wasn't God consistent and always had the firstborn is going to be the one who the seed, the promise is passed on through? Why does that not happen? Are you speaking as to why it didn't happen irregardless of the family or why didn't it did it not happen beginning with Jacob's children? Well, I'm saying even going back to the beginning, because we're going to see uh, in, you know, in Genesis, when we have Abraham, you know, is he the eldest? No, he's of, not. No, he's not. Right. So the question is, well, well why? Why is, why is he the one who the promised seed is coming through? So it seems to me that there is this literal aspect of the promised seed, which here in Deuteronomy, it's sort of reiterated. You need to follow the fact that the firstborn is the firstborn. But God hasn't followed that. He's followed the seed, this promise, as a spiritual promise right from the beginning. Right. So it's showing us from the beginning that it's not the literal firstborn, it's the spiritual firstborn that receives the promise. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, because we can see it from the beginning here. 
Yeah, so, so right from the beginning, God isn't concerned about who the literal firstborn is because this is a spiritual promise. The promise of the seed, even though it might have been taken somewhat literally by Eve, you know, when, when Cain was born, you know, that she'd got in a man, right? So this is the idea of this seed, this seed of the woman, but yet he turns out to be a murderer. So God is illustrating this promised seed is a spiritual seed, not a literal seed. You can see that in Hebrews uh, 11, I believe, the men of faith. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So in Hebrews chapter 11, when, which we studied a couple of weeks ago. Um, and which particular verse do you want to look at? Well, the people that are named there, if you think about whether they're firstborn or not, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So this is just reiterating this history, and we can see that um that this promised seed like even joseph i mean joseph how things work for him i mean he's i mean i guess he's the eldest of rachel so that's why we have that in deuteronomy 21 17 because you shouldn't be doing that taking the the wife that you love and giving her all these blessings but joseph receives the double portion which Deuteronomy 21, 17, this would have been against the law of Moses that's given here, correct? Because if Jacob had this Deuteronomy 21, verse 15 to 17, and he had favored Joseph and given him the double portion, wouldn't he not have transgressed this law? Because he had two wives, and he hated one, and he loved the other. But the one that receives the double portion is the firstborn of the one that he loved, not the firstborn of the one that he hated. And as you pointed out, that you see that hap things like that happening all down through history. Right. So Maybe even though, Christ. yeah, yeah. So even though we have this literal law of that God is is giving we can see that that's not that that doesn't apply that when you look at the law in the book of Hebrews can the law save anyone and I'm not just talking about the the law of the Ten Commandments but the ceremonial law can can a man, can the blood of bulls and goats take away sin No. No. So when David commits murder and adultery, he can't appeal to some sacrifice because there is no sacrifice for willful sin. So so when we look at what's happening here in this law, in this this covenant that was being made and and these conditions, we can see that God supersedes these conditions in the spiritual application of his law and his covenant throughout history. He's that first shall be last and he's that he that is last shall be first. Because God doesn't, God cares about the heart, not the status of, you know, of being firstborn. So that they that are Abraham's seed are those that are the spiritual children of Abraham, not the literal children. And yet we know that Christ is a descendant because we can follow his line in the Bible. He's a descendant of King David. A promise is made to David. Jesus is the son of David, literally. But he's also a spiritual son because he's born of the Holy Spirit. So understanding this firstborn, uh, there's a lot to it, which I'm not saying that I fully understand it, but 
we can see that there is a literal and a spiritual in connection with the firstborn. So when we go back to Numbers chapter 3, and it, and it talks about this, um, <clears throat> where we read here. So that was verse 12. And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from the, among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So here in this history, the Levites now receive the priesthood and they're replacing the firstborn in that respect, right? So they're not replacing the firstborn with the double. Oh, guys. Yeah, hi, Mark. Hi, guys. Um, I, I, I say I am very sorry. Being, being late. Of this, you know, I apologize of you guys to the study. I apologize now. You do start do study now, and I did make it home. My first time get home, get in your boat study, first time today. Okay. I, I missed it two times, and I, I, I will uh, tomorrow and Sunday too, and I say hi to all of you. Hi, Mark. And I will put you on the mute. It, wait, I am very sorry. I am not done talking. <laughs> but I I said lots. It is it is lots of noise now. It, it, it will be. I start talking. I put a question to you guys. You hear the loud noise in the background. We have a little kitchen playing Christmas songs. Okay. Playing right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Well, know? just yeah. And, so just um, one Mark? small thing. Yeah. One small thing. I not. I not carried my stuff, and I don't I know about the man with a hello fast box. I I carried that too, and I carried this iPad with me to all the stuff in right oh, now. Yeah. I tell you that now. I let you go back, start this study, and. I'm not being rude at all till nine o'clock. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay. So, so when we're dealing with the, the firstborn, the Levites are going to replace the firstborn. And, and there's lots to this story. Um, so, but they're not going to receive the double portion because that has gone to Joseph, and they're not going to receive the kingship that's gone to Judah. So they're just going to receive as far as part as far as the, the promise of the firstborn. They're just receiving, um, they're just taking the place of the priesthood, right? That's what we understand. <clears throat> Now, why did why did the Levites receive the priesthood? What was the background of that? Well, they're the ones that stayed faithful. Okay, it, it when? Now that was uh, let's see. We studied it. Moses, yeah. Thought oh, when Moses came down from the mount, or um, no, no, not the mount. Um, yeah, well, yeah, the mount. So there's an issue yeah. with the golden calf. Yeah, yeah. And and it's the children of Levi that, <clears throat> that stood with, with Moses, right? 
Right. So when they have this false worship being presented, the Levites, they're going to stand with Moses. And so they're going to be given the priesthood. That's my understanding of it. Anybody else have any thoughts about that? That seems to me to be the pivotal point. Um, that one of I in I in first of this Lord of Son of God of this old past. I am in first about that one you, you did say. Okay, you're a bit confused about that? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll just listen and maybe you'll get unconfused. Okay. Okay. So, sure. Okay. So, anyone have thoughts about the Levites, why they become the priest? Is that the correct understanding that it's because of what happened when Moses came down from Mount Sinai in the issue of the golden calf? Yes. Okay. And anyone else with thoughts on that? Now, what about the firstborn in Egypt? Remember, because we have the firstborn. Why in why in the Exodus when they have the Passover? Why are the firstborn of each household killed of the Egyptians or anyone who doesn't put the blood on the doorpost and the lentil? Lentil. So what what was happening what was happening with the Passover? What is the firstborn in each house? Why are they the ones that are going to die? Because remember, it's not everyone that's going to die in that house. It's just the firstborn. So what is God doing there with the firstborn in the Exodus? They're being set aside from all of the other progeny of the family. Okay. And so God is, in a sense, redeeming the firstborn at the Passover. Correct. Okay. So, so first, we know that there's this promise of the firstborn of the promised seed. But we're now going to see that the firstborn is particularly given to God because God redeems them at the Passover. Now, I, I'm not sure the whole significance of that, of why that happens, because I often ask why. Um, but God is illustrating something. I just don't know fully what he's illustrating. I just know that it happened. And I know then here in Numbers chapter 3, and this is going to be, um, uh, you know, a year or so later that you're going to have this firstborn when he says, because the firstborn are mine, for on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, mine they shall be, I am the Lord. So in Numbers 3.13, we can see that the firstborn are now his. God has taken the firstborn. Now, does this mean that initially the firstborn would have been the ones that ministered in the temple. That that's what could have happened or should have happened. Looks like it could certainly have been possible. Yeah, so, so that's the impression I get here is that, that the firstborn were his and, and that they would be the ones that minister in the temple. But instead, at the rebellion that happened with the golden calf, the sons of Levi, they're now going to take the place of the firstborn. That's what seems to be saying, being said here. It's not explicitly stated exactly, 
that that's why. But we know the firstborn are gods, and 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 that would me uh, seem to imply it would to me to my thinking imply that they would then be the ones that would minister in the sanctuary. But instead, it's going to be the Levites. So then we have um, this next part, which is rather interesting. And any thoughts on that before we go into the counting of these and the redemption of the, the firstborn of the Levites? Okay, so it says here um, in verse 14, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi after the house of their fathers, by their families, every male from a month old and upward shall thou number them. So they're going to number the children of Levi. Um, and these are their basically the families, the three sons of Levi, Kershaw, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. So then it's going to name the different sons of Gershon and so forth. But the thing that matters to us here is the number of the children of Gershon are going to be, um, in verse 22, those that were numbered of them, according to the number of the males, from a month old and upward, even those that were numbered of them were 7,500. Now, they're going to count all of the males of the Levites, not just the firstborn. So there's going to be 7,500 uh, Levites, a month old, and upward of the Gersh, Ger, of the children of Gershon. And it tells you where they're going to pitch their tents, etc. And then you have the children of Kohath. So um, his you have his sons, Aram is his eldest son, but it's going to name the different sons. And the number of all the males from a month old and upward were 8,600, keeping the charge of the sanctuary. And then you're going to see the numbers of Merari, right? So the numbers of the children of Merari, those are going to be, um, where's this here? Uh, 6,200. So we're going to write these numbers down. Uh, we got 7,500 of the Gershon, Gershonites, right? 7,500. 8,600 of the children of Kohath and Merari, it's going to be 6,200. So we're going to write this down. I'm going to go to the whiteboard. So you got um, Gershon. 7,500, we have Kohath, 8,600, and then Merari, it was 6,000, how many was it? 200, 6,200. 200, okay, yeah. So I think I got that right. Now we add these up. How many is this going to be? Twenty two three hundred. Twenty two thousand three hundred. Okay. I think that's correct. <clears throat> now, some people say, well, why is it such round numbers? Is this just rounded up or rounded down? So I mean some people say, you know, it's pretty weird that it's round it, it's either rounded up or down to the hundreds or it's actually happens to be exactly that many. So there's people who always question, you know, why, why is this? Maybe it's, it's not actually that number. They just multiplied the number by a hundred and it was really less than that. Uh, you see all kinds of theories people have. Um, but the thing that we see is definitely that it's, uh, that's what the Bible gives us and that's what we're going to go with. And I believe it to be correct. Now, 
What they're going to do then is these are all the male children, but now they're going to look at all the other tribes and they've added these, the number of all the other tribes, how many there are. So of the firstborn, right? So they're not going to number every male. They're just going to number the firstborn. So it says in verse 40, the Lord said unto Moses, number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward and take the number of their names. And thou shalt take the Levites, for I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the cattle of the Levites, instead of all the firstlings among the cattle of the children of Israel. So they can also do this with the cattle as well. And Moses numbered as the Lord commanded him, all the firstborn among the children of Israel and all the firstborn males by the number of names from a month old and upward of those that were numbered of them were 22,203 score and 13. And the Lord said unto Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle and the Levites shall be mine. So when we look at this number, what is the number of all the firstborn? What's the number they give? Anybody? Or I need to switch screens here. What's the number? Can somebody tell me the number that they give there? Twenty-two thousand two hundred three score and thirteen. So, so that's twenty-two thousand. Okay, twenty-two thousand two hundred and seventy-three. Correct. Now we're going to see something interesting here as they deal with this math. So, <clears throat> go back to the Bible here. So it says, um, verse 43, right? So we had 22,203 score and 13. Now we added up all the, the, the first, uh, all the children of the Levites, and it was 22,300. And it says, for those that are redeemed of the 203 score and 13 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, which are more than the Levites. So it's telling us, that there's 273 children more than the number of the children of the Levites. Is that what we see with these numbers, 22,300 and 22,273? Does it there appear to be 273 more firstborn of the children of Israel more than the Levites? The question is why when we add this together, do we get 22,300, not 22,000, right? So when you look at the whiteboard there, and we added up Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, we got this number 22,300. But the number that they're going to use is 22,000. So why? Good question. <laughs> okay. Now, there are different solutions that people come up with. Would that, wouldn't that be the, um, the 144,000 here for 300? Okay, so you have this 300 that are separated out. They're not going to be involved in, in this calculation. Then these are the dates that okay. will be produced. Okay, I hear myself talking back to me. I'm not sure why. 
so why do we have this 300 extra that aren't going to be counted? So we had counted them, but and we added them up, they're 22,300. And, and we noticed this number 300. Now that can't be the result of rounding because if you had just rounded, well, that would be rounding up 100 for each one. So it wouldn't come up to 300. So you couldn't use rounding as an argument. And in either you would round up or round down. But even if you round it up, you would have to round up for three, 100 for each of the three sons of Levi. Now, what else could this 300 be? Why would they not be included in this calculation? It's because they're gonna just use 22,000 instead of 22,300. I really don't know whether this has any bearing on it, but I'm thinking of, like I put in chat there, Judges 7, 3, and 6, because it mentions 22,300 there, but it also mentions other numbers too, 10,000 and so on. Yes, yeah, so it mentions 22,000 there, Return to the People of Gilead. Yeah, whether that has anything to do with it, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so, but... We have this 22,000 that is used in this calculation. So they're not going to use 20,300. They're going to take the 300 off because you would actually look at this calculation that's given here. Now, there are people who say, well, this is a typo. And I have a real problem with that. And what would the problem be besides the fact that God has preserved his word? But what would be the reason to reject this as a typo? Once you permit that, um, it's kind of open door to use it anywhere you want, right? Well, I guess. But wouldn't people have noticed it and corrected it? Something very obvious like this? That is, the people copying the Bible did not consider it to be a typo. And if they had, they would have corrected it but they don't. So that means they would not have seen it as a problem. So, so there's a 300 that are not being counted. So what would the 300 represent? The 144,000. Okay, so you say the 144,000. Why is the 300 representing the 144,000? Well, because this Gideon, this Gideon's 300, ain't it? Right. This is Gideon's 300. So, so we're going to, we're going to recognize that there's this odd number here that this odd calculation, but this is in God's providence that this is real. This isn't, you know, some typo and it's there purposefully, even though it's not explained why. And, and, and people speculate as to why, and, you know, I've even speculated as to why, but but I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to say is that the the number 300 has a symbol, and that's not going to be counted for the children of Levi. 300 are taken out. Now, one of the speculations I'll just mention one is that they're actually too old to 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 work in the service of the sanctuary, and that could be a possibility that there's 300 even though they're um, of the children of Levi, that they're just not included. But the question is, why are they in the count to begin with? Wouldn't you have mentioned the count and said, from this age to this age, and then just not include them? So, so we don't know the answer why in any sort of specific way. But what we do know is that when the calculation is done, the 300 are excluded in that calculation. <clears throat> So when we go back here, now the number 273, we understand the significance of it in this movement. And this is 
a symbol for the Levites. So when we uh, gotta go for, for number twenty-two, it too is kind of significant. Yeah, twenty-two is also significant as a number of restoration. Um, and Moses numbered as the Lord commanded him all the firstborn of the children of Israel. So we know that the number of the firstborn of the children of Israel says are 22,203 score and 13. That's 22,273. And then in verse five, he says, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, right? And for those that are redeemed of the 203 score and 13 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, which are more than the Levites. So it's saying that there's 273 more than the Levites. So the number they're using is 22,000. It says, thou shalt take, uh, shall even take five shekels a piece by the pole after the shekel of the sanctuary shalt thou take them. The shekel is 20 giras. So this is one of those verses where we have the idea that the shekel is 20 giras. So remember in Daniel chapter five, with the writing on the wall, meaning, meaning, tackle you farson, it's 126 shekels. And if you multiply 126 by 20, you would have 25, 20 giras. Right. And I think it's also the same number in, in old English currency when you have uh, a guinea. A guinea, I think, is 25, 20 pence. But anyway, that's something else aside from that. But here we have this um, this this five shekels. So there's going to be 2,000 or 273 um, firstborn of the children of Israel more than the Levites, and then they're going to take this money, and and this money is going to be um, redeemed unto Aaron and his sons. Now, I've, I've looked at this before, and I always was confused about it. Thou shalt give the money wherewith the odd number of them is to be redeemed unto Aaron and his sons. So this money is going to be paid to Aaron and his sons. So it's just saying, Aaron and his sons, these are, of course, children of Levi as well. But the money is going to be given to the priesthood. The priests are going to receive this money. So who's going to pay the money? I mean, we know it's going to be given for 273 people. that are more than the children of Levi. So that means who's gonna be paying the money? Verse 31, it says Moses uh, gave them Gave the money to them. Well, he took the redemption money of them that were over and above them that were redeemed by the Levites. Of the firstborn of the children of Israel took he the money. So it's going to be from the firstborn of the children of Israel. Now, now it's only going to be the ones that are 273 more. So that means not all the firstborn of the children of Israel are going, or you're not going to just take 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel and get them to pay it. It must be paid from all of the firstborn of the children of Israel. And, and this is going to be 1,300, three score and five shekels. That's um, 1,365 shekels. So that's 273 times um five right so so i'm not sure exactly how they do this how they decide to get this money who they're going to take it from whether they take all the firstborn of israel and have them pay an amount that it that that comes to this number that seems to me to be what is uh being understood here 
So just to, um, you got 273 and you're gonna multiply this by five. So this is the number. Now, what's the significance of this number? I mean, it's, it's 273 times five. How many tribes are there? Okay, is there 12 tribes? Technically, there's 13. Okay, there's 13 tribes, right? So if I take this number and I divide it by 13, I get 105. So 105 is a symbol of what? Tenth day of the fifth. Tenth day of the fifth month. So that's the, the date the temple was destroyed in 586 and in 70 AD. Now, if I take this number and I say, okay, there's, there's 13 tribes, but we know that one of the tribes is going to be removed. And that tribe is the tribe of Levi. So if I take this number and multiply it by 12, I get 1260. That is the number... 1365 is 105 more than 1260. So there is a significance in this number. And of course, this tells us the number, the 10th day of the fifth month. If we multiply it by 12, we get 1260. So it just gives us these other symbols. So 1365 is not some arbitrary number. It's a number that represents, in a hidden way, the, 20, the 1260, which is also a symbol of the 2520. So we do remember when we studied Acts 27 that we also got this same number. Right. So for those of you who may not know, we're just going to go here again. This is a, a, a journey of Paul which is a symbolic trip. We're not gonna go into the whole symbolism of this trip. We're not gonna do a study on Acts 27. I do a Two video ships. on it. Yeah, so, yeah. Two ships, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so there's different ships, but there's one ship that they're in when they finally hit this storm, right? And um, there is going to be people on the ship and there's going to be 276 people on the ship, but three of them are Christians. That's Paul. Um, it's, um, what's the names of all of them? You got Paul. Who else is with him? Luke and Aristarchus. Yeah, so you got Luke and Aristarchus. So now originally Tess had this symbol of what these were, what these people represented. Uh, but, but we can say that they represent the priests at the very least. And that the, so there's 276. Three of them are priests. What would be the significance of three? The Trinity. Okay, the Trinity. But also, what about the 300 we had in Numbers chapter 3? Is 3 a symbol of 300? Yeah, it can be. Yeah. So so we could look at that that story and see that there's some similarities in these numbers. Now... We also can look at that it's Acts 27 and Numbers 3. So that's 273 as well, right? So there's going to be 276 people on the ship. Three are priests. 273 are Levites. 
So it's a symbol of the Levites. And we can take Acts 27 and Numbers 3 and put them together to get the symbol of 273. Now, we also have another symbol that happens, and that has to do in the measurement uh, when they're coming, when they're measuring uh, the depth of the water. And they're going to measure it, and it's going to be 20 fathoms. And then you measure it again, and it's 15 fathoms. So to go back to my calculator. Um, so we know that uh, 20 fathoms, there's 72 inches to a fathom. So that's going to be 1440. So we get that number that's 1 hundredth of 144,000. And that ties us to that symbol that we had of the 300. Now, there's also how many minutes in a day? Fourteen forty. Yeah, fourteen forty. And that's because there's sixty minutes in an hour, and there's twenty-four hours in a day, and you multiply them together, you get fourteen forty. That's why a hundred days has one hundred and forty-four thousand minutes, like the hundred days of prayer. That went from March twenty-seventh, which is a symbol of two seventy-three, to July fourth. Inclusive count for those days, so that hundred days of prayer. Um, was 144,000 minutes because there's 1,440 minutes in a day. Now, the other number, 15 fathoms, 15 times 72, is this number. And this is the number of parts of an hour on the Jewish way of reckoning. So these is, there's um, 1,080 helichem in an hour. Now, in, in a day, you multiply this by 24, and you get this number 25920, which is a number related to the MOLAD interval. So that's a whole other topic. Uh, but this number is significant as well. Um, but now if you take this 1,080, whoops, and you add it together to the 1,440, you can see we get the number 2520. So in this story in Acts 27, we have in symbol the 300 and the 273. And also we have this doubling of the 1260, which is the 2520. So we have the same symbols in Acts 27 as we have in Numbers chapter 3. But the question, so we've noticed these things before. This is nothing new. But the question has to go back to understanding Numbers 3 itself. Because we're dealing with this firstborn. This firstborn is this promised seed, is related to the promise of the seed. And it's going to go through these generations all the way up to Jacob. And then Jacob is going to divide that birthright amongst his 12 sons so that Joseph gets the double portion. Levi gets the priesthood and Judah gets the kingship. And then we're going to see um, that later. Um, and what year does uh, Jacob bless his sons? Uh, I wish Stephen was here because he probably knows that. How old was Jacob when he blessed his sons? Because it's, it's not the day he dies. Um, and I wonder if we know specifically. I know he's going to live after that. Um, is it just before he dies? It says here in verse 33, when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into, his, into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So it looks like he dies right then. No. I always thought it was he died later, but...
Okay, so does anybody know when Jacob dies, what year? He was 147. Yeah, he's 147. And it's at the end of that prophetic mirror in the story of Joseph, correct? So if we yes. go here. So here's this prophetic mirror. And this is this one where we have the story of Joseph. And, and Jacob's story is interesting to begin with. So we know that Jacob uh, is 77 when he works for um, Laban. And he works seven years for Leah. And then he gets married to two women when he's 84. Seven times 12 is 84. He's going to have 12 children in the next seven years, if you include uh, Dinah, um, because Benjamin's going to be born later. But he does also have 12 sons eventually, just not in that period of time. No, he has 11 children in seven years. He has 12. No. He has 11 sons. He has 10 sons in the seven years because you have it clearly pointed out on the chart that Joseph is born at the end of that seventh year for Rachel. Yeah, but that's why I'm counting because he's not going to okay. have... He's not going to have a son on the first, as soon as he's married, it's going to be about a year later. So the, in okay. that, that's in the period of those seven years. All right. Okay. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but yeah, we, we, we just count it that Joseph is born in those seven years. All right. Right. At the end of that seven years, but it's still in the seven years. Yeah. So you're correct. We're just, we're expressing it differently. So, um, now then we have the story of Joseph, which we, we've gone through before, but it's going to be in 1731 that Jacob is going to die. So it, it, it appears that this, a blessing happens at the end of this period from when Jacob is 77 to when he's, um, 147, which is a period of 70 years. So from the time he begins working for Laban to the time that he dies is 70 years. So you can see not just that we have these periods of seven years, and which also occur in the story of Joseph, but we have this period of 70 years as well. And then we're gonna have, so this is the center point with Jacob's 130, that's the center of the 430 years. So that 430 years is going to end at the Exodus in 1533. And it's going to be a year later that we're going to have uh, the redemption of the Levites of the firstborn, where the Levites replace the firstborn. But in 1533 at the Exodus itself is when the firstborn becomes the Lord's, that, that they're supposed to, that they're purchased in a sense by the blood of Christ with the Passover lamb's blood that's put on the lentil and the doorposts. Now, I always ask these questions, why? But the question is, what, what significance are we seeing when we go back to the promised seed and we look at the promises that were made to Abraham regarding his seed and uh, to Isaac and his seed, and to Jacob and his seed. And then we see this, this promise that Jacob does to his seed in that he distributes this, this blessing among his 12 sons. And also he gives a blessing to Joseph's sons. What is happening here in relationship to redemption? What is God doing? With all these, these covenant promises relating to the seed, how does this relate back to the original promise and why is it unfolding in this way? It's kind of a big question, but I want you to think about it. And how does it relate to Revelation chapter 12 and, and all of the book of Revelation?
So who are the first born? Who receives the promises at the end of the world? Well, you have the remnant. Okay, you have the remnant. Right? The revelation. So we know about the remnant of her seed. So, so let's go there. So to try to answer this question, instead of going to the beginning, we're going to go to the end. So first thing, let's look at, um, oh, no, that's not where I want to go. Revelation chapter 7. So Revelation chapter 7, we have the 144,000. And these are going to be those that are sealed out of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Of course, we know these are not the literal tribes. That is the 144,000 is not literal Israel. It's spiritual Israel. And why do we know that? Well, for starters, some of the tribes don't exist anymore. Okay. So, right. So, Dan, well, one is Dan is not there in this tribe. Also, right. yeah. the literal tribes of Israel don't exist. That is, we know, you know, there are Levites. There are, um, you know, Benjamites. There are people of the tribes of Judah. You know, there might be people from some other tribes that exist. But pretty much the ten times tribes were scattered Never to, never to be gathered. So they're not always, they just don't exist. So it can't be those. Some people argue, you know, that, 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 that you know, there's British Israelism. That's, uh, bef before I was an Adventist, I followed Herbert W. Armstrong. And he taught that uh, the children of Dan had gone to, uh, you know, like Ireland and, and so forth. Um, all these different theories that they had, and they were based on pretty sketchy arguments. But when I was young, you know, like 19, 18, 17 years old, uh, those arguments seemed pretty forceful until I really started looking into it. Um, but anyway, we, we don't take that position. We don't say that these are literally the children of Israel because it's spiritual Israel. And we know that when probation closed for the Jewish nation, that literal Israel, the only way they could have a part in the promises is to be grafted onto Christ. That is, they have to become Christians, that there is no salvation through literal Israel. Just being a descendant of literal Israel is not going to bring about salvation. So, so this is spiritual. But yet we're having this symbolism here and we're, we're going to have 12,000 out of all these different tribes, which are symbols, right? And they might represent characters, um, you know, certain types of people or individuals in some way, but whatever way it is, you know, the Bible isn't explicit on it. We would have to infer it, but we know that it's just not literal but that it's going back to the Old Testament and telling us something about this history. So we're going to have the 144,000 mentioned. And of course, we have all the sanctuary symbolism mentioned. Now, the other one we went to was Revelation 12. Now, the seed of the woman is Christ. And so this woman that's clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, who's going to give birth, is not Mary. Now, there are different views on this verse. One is, I've taken the position, whether it's right or wrong, that this verse is fulfilled in our time on September 23rd, 2017. That is, if you look at the sky, the, the first time that this occurs in history is that date. And that is when you look at the constellation Virgo, because this is a wonder that's in heaven, and there's a woman in September, uh, the, the sun is in Virgo. Now she's going to have the moon under her feet. What would the moon under her feet, when does that occur? If the sun's in Virgo 
and she has the moon under her feet, when would that occur? What time of the month? Time when of the new moon. The time of the new moon, right? Because you couldn't have the moon at the same side as the sun unless it's the new moon. And it's going to be the first visible crescent. And, and this is going to be the first day of the seventh month that this occurs. So that was in 2017. That was September 23rd. Now, September 23rd is 777 days before November 9th, 2019. So, so it's quite significant. But more than that, even though every September the sun is in Virgo, it's not always going to be, um, you know, the timing of when the, 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 the new moon occurs is going to occur at different times. You know, so the new moon can, can fluctuate, uh, you know, in that, that month, so to speak, between a, a period of 30 days. So, so that means the, the first of Tishri is, in, is, is going to be on different dates in different years. But of course, you still could have the moon under her feet on different dates. It's not like this is the only date that you could have that. But it also has, uh, she has a crown of 12 stars. Now, normally, there are nine stars above the constellation Virgo, above her head. So in order for there to be 12 stars, that is three of the planets need to be above her head. And this occurs on September 23rd, 2017. Now, another thing also occurs is that uh, the planet Jupiter is going to be in the womb of this woman for nine months. And on September 23rd, she's going to leave the womb of the woman. So, the, so Jupiter's being a symbol of, of Christ in this case. So Christ is going to be born. Now, some people try to apply this to, to narrow down when Jesus was born. That is, they, they look back at the past around the time that Jesus was born. And if you look at the time Jesus was born, you're going to have a similar situation, but it's not identical. But we apply this, of course, to Christ's birth. But does Christ's birth symbolize, does this, is this woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, can this apply to our time as well? You mean when you say our time, you mean September 23, yeah, to our, Well, to our history, to our movement. Can we take this symbol? Now, so here's what I'm saying. I believe that this is significant, but not for the reason the people who notice this believed it to be significant. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, from September 23rd, 2017, we're going to count 1260 days to the second coming of Christ or to some other event that they that they predicted from so three and a half years from September 23rd 2017 they're going to have some event so different religious groups noticed this and they all had different prophecies regarding this but they're going to use literal days were they correct I would say no. Yeah, so they weren't. So so obviously this is a false prophecy. That is, it didn't happen. None of what they predicted happened. Um and and this would have brought you to March 6th, 2021. Now March 6th 
2021 is interesting because as a symbol, it's the sixth day of the third month on our calendar. So, so that's kind of interesting in that way. That's a symbol of Pentecost. And, and it did occur in our history. There is significance in that date in our lines. So we can see that this can only be symbolic if we're applying it to our history. That is what we can, what we can do is we can take the history of the past and we can lay it over top of our history, but we can't take this prophecy like the Protestants did and say, this prophecy is fulfilled on September 23rd, 2017. And then on March 6th, 2021, the period of 1260 days is going to end and maybe the secret rapture was going to happen that day or different things that people predicted. But we can see that this is the history from the time of Christ and it's going to lead to the period of the 1260 years of papal persecution, right? In Revelation 12:6. In 12:6 you have the 1260 days where the women fled in the wilderness. Okay. So, so I'm not saying that I'm going to take Revelation chapter 12 and say that this prophecy is just pointing to September 23rd. It's actually referring to the birth of Christ. And this woman is the church. It's not Mary, but it's a symbol. And we have a dragon. So this is about the promised seed. But can we take this promised seed and apply it to this movement? Or is that presumption? I think there is a way of applying it. I don't think it's mm-hmm. presumptive at all. Okay. You can apply it in different ways. Right. And so, so we can look at it symbolically that this movement is relating to... So one thing is we're seeing that this is a false prediction. Right. So that that's important. And uh, we know November 9th was also a false prediction. That is the thing that were were predicted for November 9th. None of them happened. And Jeff recognized this before November 9th, that none of them were going to happen. But we made a prediction of July 18th and July 18th is also maybe a false prediction isn't quite the word, but a failed prediction that is. It was led of God, as was November 9th, and I think also a September 23rd was. That is, I believe that these were in God's providence. Now, for me, the significant thing of September 23rd, 2017, is that I was at Lambert Church. Um, I haven't done many sermons at Lambert Church. I, I think I might have done three, but I can only think of two at the present time. But I was presenting at Lambert Church regarding Samuel Snow's letters, specifically that July 18th was the prediction before midnight. And this happened to be 777 days before November 9th, 2019. So I I don't think that we could just dismiss this as insignificant, that September 23rd, 2017 is an important date. And that it is part of a structure that we have in our lines. But we can see that it was also telling us that our prediction was going to fail. That is, that was the view that I had when I first saw September 23rd, 2017. Because... I had put it in in a line, which I'll show you here in a minute. As soon as I bring it up, um, you have that. You have that astronomy program program on there. Yeah, I do. Do you want uh, me to bring uh, that up? September twenty three, two thousand seventeen. Yeah. Okay. That? Yeah, I can bring it up. Oh, okay, so that'd be inter- interesting to see that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so I'll bring that up. Well, actually, I can just bring up one of my papers that has it in there. That's going to be simpler. It'll be faster. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So just hang on a second. I got to organize all this. So I'm going to bring up uh, that paper. 
and that also has the chart so that'll just make it easier okay so i'll share this so this is a paper called the 777 chiasm in relation to the july 18 2020 prediction so in this paper i have all of this stuff marked out um lots of information here i'm just gonna zoom out a bit so i can see the whole pages um So this is the picture we're talking about. Whoops. And so this one's a little bit tough to see, but this is this is the constellation Virgo. This is the womb. Um, and you can see all this. This is actually from the Wikipedia page. Um, uh, the Revelation 12 sign prophecy. And of course, they're going to misrepresented a little bit just so that people uh don't understand it but jupiter remains in virgo for approximately nine months and uh so there's that picture and i'm going to zoom out again i thought there was the other picture too in here but i might have not put that one picture in okay so i just have that one picture um I'm just going to do it this way. Well, it looks like they've edited their page on Wikipedia. So they don't have as much about it. Uh, uh, that's they put all they put all the constellations on the page, huh? Yeah. Looks like, looks like. Okay, so here is. Um, yeah, maybe I should just bring up the program, but it it takes a while to queue it up. So here's the pictures I want. So um just share this a lot more things on here than i want to see advertising and everything okay so this see these are the constellations this is how you will see it in uh the program which i use which is um uh I can't remember the name of it. I'll think of it when I'm not thinking of it. Um, so this is the constellation Virgo. You can see here's Jupiter coming out. You're not uh, sharing that one. Oh, I'm not showing it. I didn't hit share. There we go. There we go. So, there, so you're going to see Jupiter. You're going to see the moon under her feet. And then the crown of 12 stars. And, and this is in the constellation Leo which is above her head. And you're going to have Mars, Mercury, and um, what's the other one that's added? The, the sun is just by her head, right? The sun's by her head. Yeah, and Venus. So, yeah. Or that, so that's Venus? Knows, yeah, Venus is that. So Mars, Mercury, and Venus are the three that are added to the nine stars of the constellation Leo. So she's crowned oh, okay. with all stars. Yeah, and, and then the sun is in Virgo. And, the red and, arrow the red arrow is jupiter right yeah and that's just come out of it's come out okay of her womb so to speak the, the, i mean they have the constellation kind of because they, they got her legs matched up but her womb is over here and but her body's sort of to the side because just how they put the picture um so now this just zooms in more on the stars the the 12 stars so so that helps a little bit and what's the name of the program oh, i can't think of it okay now 
what I'm going to show here, I'm going to flip this sideways, uh, rotate, zoom in here. So this is the, the whole chiasm. It's not, I know it's not great to look at. Um, this is December 21st, 2012. And this is December 25th, 2021. So it goes, spans 3,291 days. Um, here you can see September 23rd and the 777 days on the right with November 9th in the center and then 777 days with December 25th on the right. So, but we go back to the beginning of this, December 21st, 2012, is the false prediction regarding the end of the world using the Mayan calendar. And 777 days later is February 6th, 2015, which happens to be my birthday. And then another 777 days that go to March 24th, 2017. I'm not going to go into the whole structure of this because this would be quite a study. But this 3,291 days matches up with 329 days uh, between October 13th, 2018 and September 7th, 2019. That's the period of, of time where Jeff... Uh, um, Jeff comes out of hiding and he began his hiding. Um, the center of that is March 27th, 2019. So I'm not going to go into that. It's just too much detail. The point is, this is a false prediction. September 23rd is a false prediction. November 9th is a false prediction. And so from that, I concluded that possibly... Uh, July 18th, 2020 would be a false prediction. That is, it wouldn't happen uh, the way that we expected. So, so there's a lot of detail there. You don't need to remember all of it. But what we want to do is we want to look then again at this Revelation chapter 12. So Revelation chapter 12 has these symbols. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 15. Now, in this context, when we go through this story of Revelation chapter 12, this is the story of the 144,000. And this seed of the woman is who that's going to flee into the wilderness. So we have this man child that's born. We know that's Christ. But this woman that fle flees into the wilderness, this is the church. Does she have a seed that is going to be born at the end of the world? That is, is what's happening here typical of the end of the world? I don't I know that one. Okay. So when we start going, and we don't have time to go through all these, but we go through Revelation chapter 13, and we look at these beasts, and we look at um, the prophecies regarding these things. We're going to have Revelation 14. That's the 144,000. And it says regarding them. And remember, we talked about the first fruits. Now, the first fruits are related to the firstborn. They're, they're, they're a different symbol telling us the same thing. So they're not the same symbol, but they are related. So the first fruits are going to be the 144,000. And then, then they're going to have the three angels' messages. So things are not chronological here. So when we go through this whole story, and we just don't have time because I'm running late, um, we finally come to the end, to a new heaven and a new earth. And, and we're, we're going to go through this again. So even though we're just touching on it right now. So who is it that Christ redeems?
it, it, it's kind of a, a trick question. Who does Christ redeem? Maybe me telling you it's a trick question makes you uncertain about answering. They sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So are the 144,000 redeemed? Yes. Are they, right. are they the only ones that are redeemed? No. No. Okay. Because they're the first fruits. These are they which were not defiled with women for their um, I read, I say to you now, they do what I say, excuse me, please. Yeah. Okay. Sorry being rude. I have a question. Okay. Right now, uh, that question made me to watch Sid Wars at TG Jakes and Dr. David Jamaya saying he is um, um, Dr. David Jamaya talking about where uh, Dr. David Jamaya saying where um, he make uh, Dr. David Jamaya making a book he talking about where we are going here. Okay, I don't, I don't think I'm going to agree with Sid Roth and. Oh uh, no 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 um. You're saying that they have a different view than I do. No, is um, I'm not talking about Sid Roth right now. No, Dr. David Jeremiah. Oh, they they all you yes. mentioned you know. Yes, um, Doctor. Yeah, uh, I am saying about. Dr. David Mamaya, he making a book yeah. about where we go here. Okay. He but I don't agree with him. And he talking about our visions and mark of the beast. Right. But he doesn't have the right ideas about that. Do, do you? I do. Um, do you talking about uh, believers, how to get Mark of the Beast? Well, the Mark of the Beast is Sunday. You know, it's on our forehead. But that's just a symbol. It, it's in our thoughts and in our actions, the right hand and the forehead. So it's not referring to a literal mark. So they're Why making not? a mistake because that's not what the Bible's talking about. There's two, and, there's the seal of God, which is the Sabbath, and the mark of the beast, which is Sunday. So it has to do with character. It doesn't have to do with some literal mark. So that's where I would disagree with people like David Jeremiah and Sid um, no, um, um, all by buddy, all by buddy, Amy, quite doctor. That is his, his full name. Dr. I know, I understand that. Maya. But he's still you, wrong. You know, you say his name wrong. You know, Do yeah, Doctor. Yeah, 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 under it has to be Doctor David Jeremiah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so to just kind of tie these things up as we're finishing this study, 
So we went back just to, to look at this again. We started at Revelation chapter 12. We went back to Genesis chapter 3. And we could see there's this thread of the seed of the woman and that this is tied up with the firstborn. Now, at the end of the world, we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But these are a counterfeit of something. And what are they a counterfeit of? Are they a counterfeit of the, the promise to the firstborn or the birthright? How could that be? Okay. So the woman represents a church, which represents the priesthood. We have the state. That would be, who would the state be? Who would, so if we, if we have, um, how would I put this? So in the first bite, we first, the birthright of the firstborn, we have the double portion, the priesthood and the kingship. So the kingship would be the state. The priesthood is the church. And what's the double portion? So we have these three. Can these be counterfeited? In some way. What is it that uh, Abraham was promised? that his seed would become as numerous as the stars above okay and also he was promised the land correct right? okay and that land represents the world does it not it can and it was specific at that time but no it can represent the entire world yes right and, and god's going to give us this world at the end he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth or how about the heavenly city he was searching for? Yeah, so which is a heavenly city. That's what he was looking for. And we know that that city is going to be on earth after a thousand years. So the promises that were made to Abraham in the firstborn, Satan is counterfeiting those in his threefold union. That is, he's offering us the world. The United Nations is the world. That's Greece. That's the globalists. So can we see that those three symbols in the firstborn are being counterfeited in the threefold union? Does, does that make sense? Anybody want to question that? I mean, because I kind of just jumped into it without... Um, a lot of preparation. Could you more succinctly state that? Okay. So we have in, in the birthright, you have the priesthood, the kingship, and the double portion. The double portion relates to the land. Um, and it's going to relate to the land of promise as well, because Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are each given a double. They're, they're given the double portion. Joseph gets the double portion through his two sons. But at the end of the world, Satan has counterfeited that. We know that Satan is the dragon, but he's also, the dragon represents pagan Rome. And, and Rome represents the world. And at the end, it's the United Nations that is the dragon power. That's the world. That's the double portion. But it's a counterfeit. It's not the true. And then you have the, the woman and which is, is the church. In this case, you have a prostitute, right? That's, that's the Catholic church. 
And then you have the false prophet. So is the false prophet, is that somehow related to the kingship? As a counterfeit. That's possible. Because the United States, what does the United States do at the end of the world? What is their role? Becomes the false prophet. Right, they become the false prophet. And they're a mixture of church and state, but it's through their political actions, through their legal inactions, when they speak as a dragon, that's the state, isn't it? Yes. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that Satan is a counterfeiter. He doesn't have one original idea other than maybe his rebellion against God. But at the end, we have this contrast between two groups of people, the 144,000, which is the promised seed. Can we agree that the 144,000 are the promised seed at the end of the world. Yes. Okay. And those are in contrast to Satan's seed. That is the whole world. And they're seeking to inherit the world with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, these three powers. And they stand in opposition to the promised seed, the true seed. And so we can see that persecution that we see in Revelation chapter 12, because it's the dragon or the world that persecutes God's people. Yet it's, it's also the papacy. Right. So, so there's lots in this. Now we're going to, we're going to come back to this as we go through these studies, because I, I kind of went to the end of this study because we're, we need to clarify a lot of things that we see in Revelation. But I didn't see how I could look at this line of this promised seed and look at the firstborn without seeing this connection. That there is a counterfeit and there is a true. And the 144,000 are the true. And this ties in with my studies in the book of Hebrews. So uh, tomorrow, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12 at uh, 2 in the afternoon Mountain Standard Time. And this is going to address this same thing that we just talked about, but from a different perspective. <coughs> so, so that's what I want to look at tomorrow. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath and once again for the way that you lead and direct us. We pray that you can work in our lives and that this Sabbath will be a blessing, that you can lead and direct and guide your people. And we pray, Lord, that um, you can use us to your glory. We know that Christ can be born in us and that we can reflect his character. In spite of what we see in ourselves, Lord, we know that your promises are sure. And so we trust in them. Help us to understand the things we study. Give us clear minds as we continue throughout this Sabbath and throughout the next couple of weeks, seeking to understand your will for us. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.